This is Nicole Kali with Fallon Bowman, Black Rockers United. And we reached out to the alternative diaspora since 2006 with a feeling that rockers like us needed it. And we revisit what Black history means once again with our special guest again, Fallon. Welcome to Brew TV. Hey, thank you for having me. Yes, the pleasure is all ours, Fallon. How are you doing? <laughs> doing well doing okay you know considering what's going on in the world i'm surviving i can't ask for more than that honestly at this point so yeah <laughs> <laughs> i hear that sister you know like, we're here we're still surviving and we're rocking most important yeah, that's the most important thing yes happy new year by the way yep, same to you it's literally february it's insane it's February and it's almost halfway through. Like time is just zooming on us, right? Right. <laughs> this is insane. I was just dreading 2022 for a while because I'm just like, Jesus, what else is going to be thrown at us this year? But so far, and I've been cautiously saying it's okay. Tentatively can agree that this Tentatively, is a cool year. Tentatively, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Can I just take a moment to also say this means so much to be talking to you right now? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me again. Like, really, it's, I'm surprised that people, like, even give a shit. Really? I'm like, oh, really? Okay. <laughs> Want to talk to me? I, I don't know. Uh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely, Fallon. Like, it's essential that we hear your story because you're one of the most prominent rockers of the last 30 years, you know? Like, when oh. you look at your discography and, like, your impact on metal, it is that, that big. Yeah. Oh, well. Well, <laughs> love it. Thank you. But yes, thank you. That means a lot. Yes. And every time we reflect on the last three years, especially with the pandemic and their impact on us as people, as creative people and artists, like, you know, like, I think we all deserve a lot more respect than props. So props to you, Fallon. Okay. I mean, I had uh, some people reach out to me saying, like, how are you able to be creative in this time? It's so difficult to gather up the courage and gather up the, like, muster up the courage to do this kind of work at this time because it's just so unpredictable. And I'm like, you know what? I don't know how either. Some days I'm just really productive. I don't know. TikTok has convinced me that I have ADHD and my dad likely has it as well. So that's probably where it comes from. But like, I can be incredibly productive on something for just a short period of time. And then I'm like, okay, I don't want to do this anymore. And then I'll take like a little time off. So that's how my music like productivity goes. Is so I mean it has an impact certainly, but yeah. Anyways, tangent. That is, that is relevant. You know what I mean? Like I love hearing how your creative process works with the way that you think as well, because those mm -hmm. those connected. And you can only do Perfect. things in short bursts because that's how long your attention span lasts, right? Definitely. That's yeah. Okay. You should see like I'm collecting hobbies like it's going out of style. And I never realize that that's like a problem or a thing or like part of a, when I find people on TikTok that are like, I do that too. I'm like, really? I don't feel so alone. <laughs> because I'm like, maybe I need to do knitting. Maybe I need to do crocheting. Maybe I need to do this. I have all the shit that's sitting there and I have never touched it. So bad. It's so busy, right? Like, that's also a thing. Like, where does the time come from for these things? Uh, there, there's no time. No time. No, 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 no time. <laughs> So like that leads us to not necessarily a hobby, but your latest musical project, which you're the mm -hmm. mastermind of, Amphibious Assault. Yay. All right. And that's our kind of futuristic electropunk. That's our style. So yep. how did you, from Kitty and then from Pigface, how did you find yourself in Amphibious Assault making this really cool futuristic music? I think my love affair with uh, like synthesis in general and just like working with synthesizers and not just strictly st starting on a guitar, which was how I did it previously, yeah. started probably at the end of 2000, maybe mid 2000 into 2001. And so I started like kind of thinking about how I could do either incorporate that into the next album for kitty or something like that like it, the thought was in my mind but it certainly was not something that i could bring to the table at that time because it was just like genre wise was not what we were at all which i totally understand now but at the time i didn't so i kind of kept it for myself and then i ended up leaving the band anyways so then i'm like okay well i have these ideas i didn't have any uh any synths or anything at that time yet 
but I was able to get some and then start actually writing stuff later on after I left. So it started at the end of 2001 uh, after I had like a deep depression <laughs> and then I came out of that. And then out of that came the building blocks of what became District 6, which is my first release in 2003. So wow. that was like the, when the very beginning. <laughs> That's incredible, Fallon. That's almost 20 years ago when you decided yeah. to do this, this particular song. I think it's also cool too that I was still like a teenager when I was doing that, right? Like I was yeah. still, so I had two albums, well, actually three, three. four, <laughs> four <laughs> albums. And if you like, if you count Kitty's EPs, that's one, two, three, four, that's four before I even hit 20. So I didn't think about that until recently. I was like, holy shit, okay. like. I was really cool when I was a teenager. I'm not cool anymore, but like I was cool then. Um, yes. So there's that, which is super cool. I mean, yeah. And then I came out with On Better Days and Stating Eating, which came out in 2007. And I said that I was never going to do Amphibious Assault again. I was going to kind of go more rocky and maybe do a little bit more metal kind of stuff, like faster stuff. Metal stuff didn't happen, but the rocky stuff did. I had a band called Fallon and the Grace Dynasty which was myself, my roommate, and a couple of other guys that we got together. And okay, let me tell you, <clears throat> when I was in Kitty, obviously we were children, so we didn't party, or we didn't like get like crazy, whatever. But like, when I was in the Grace Dynasty, I was in my 20s, I was fucking crazy, like crazy. <laughs> like we would get drunk and it was like a, it was a fucking party all the time. I, oh my God, I was thinking about it today. I'm like, that was so Ooh, much fun. It's like, it. we would have, band practice and then we'd be like fuck it let's go out for a rip and just get drunk <laughs> or like that was truly the rock and roll experience that i never had before and it was oh it was great it was so great so not that i'm advocating that kids don't go out and do that okay all right i was i was 25 20, 24 you know don't go out and do that just be safe, whatever. But I was not, so there, there it is. <laughs> That's the story of rock and roll, though. You know what I mean? Like now we can advocate doing it safer. But like when we were rocking, when we were that age, oh, we went all out. That was that was the time to do. <laughs> yeah, it was great. It was, it was like years to do it. Yeah. So, oh my God, like there are so many shows that we would play with punk bands or, or whatever. And the show would be insane. It would be sweaty. Or I would be just drenched in beer at the end of it. I'm like, yes. Why did we not do this when we're like in Kitty? We was not like that at all. Like it was not wild, but that was wild. That <laughs> it sounds really, really fun. Just the like Anyways, quintessential rock experience. You know what I mean? It was the rock experience indeed. And it, you know, it was very short lived and I ended up um, taking the songs that I wrote for that project and then turning that into Human Conditional, which came out under my own name because it was not quite Amphibious Assault. I mean, there were keyboards or synths in it, but it was a little bit different. It was a little bit more straight up rock. And nice. it was funny because most of the guys that I had, the session musicians that I had playing on that record were all from Nashville, like country guys. And it brought like a different vibe to the album in general. Although the keyboardist or the synth player who I got plays with Frank Ocean now. So he has like a really like weird, but I, he was a fucking genius. Oh my God. Wow. Like, I love your collection. So great. <laughs> That's so yeah. cool. Yeah, it was really fucking awesome working with him. And like the producer was really great. He was also from the country world too. So he brought like this really interesting vibe to the whole album. Mm -hmm. So I'm proud of that work. It's very, very different. It's not for everybody for, for sure, but I'm, I'm proud of what came out of that. I thought it was really good. Then I took a little bit of time off. I went to school. I got my master's degree and I have all these degrees that I use for nothing. And uh, <laughs> now <laughs> I have all this debt. It's great. And so I did not plan on really writing anything until 2014, where I was, again, I think my ADHD came in clutch for me and was like, hey, you don't need to write your master's degree right now or your master's thesis. Fuck that. You need to write music instead. And so in my way of procrastinating basically was writing what became Simulacrum, which came out in 2021. So that's last year. Yeah. Yeah. Killer album, by the way. So good. When I Very listen much. to it every time, I'm just like, this is a journey right here. Like, that one yeah, went it, somewhere with this one. I went somewhere with it for sure. I went to a decrepit cyberpunkian city you know, that was what, because it is technically a concept album. There's like a whole, 
lore behind it that I wrote. I'm writing a screenplay that's based on it. Like it's got like a, a whole thing that I envision that may or may not become anything, but all the songs are related to that world. So I'm kind of in love with making albums like that. Like I'm now working on the fourth album, which also has a whole lore history, whatever. I don't know. Nobody cares about that shit anymore. Nobody listens to albums anymore, but I do. I care. Yes. Thank you for reviving and keeping alive the concept album, because I think the concept album is kind of declining in terms of popularity. I don't, you know, I've been noticing that as well. It's like, no, keep it it here. Keep it here. (laughs) That's, that's where, yeah, that's where we are today. Yeah, absolutely. So where does your musical journey officially begin? Like, I know it's far before like Amphibious Assault and Kitty. Like, when did you first get into music as a little girl? Oh, certainly. Okay. I come from a really like musical family, I guess really only on my, my dad's side. My, I only found this out recently, but it makes so much fucking sense. I was like, oh, of course. Yeah. My grandfather came from a very large South African family. South African families are very big and they're, they're very joyous. We love to sing, we love to do well and stuff, but like they had a family band, which I didn't know. Okay. So it was my grandfather and his either his uncles and then also um, some other like cousins and stuff. And they were all in a band together. And I don't remember, I think my grandfather played guitar. I don't, I don't remember what he played, but he played an instrument within this band, which I was like, of course he did. Like, geez, <laughs> where, where would it come? And he had the most angelic, beautiful voice whenever he would sing, like he had a uh, kind of a smoky bluesy voice but it was beautiful at the same time and yeah he was like the first person that was ever super musical around me like my my dad could sing too and my mom can sing as well my sister can sing as well but like he was the first one they played guitar and sang that I could remember or that I vaguely remember anyways yeah I think it started then like very young very very young that he introduced me to then like my my parents are super my dad especially like huge into, you know, the classics, I guess, classic rock, huge into classic rock and got me into that just by proximity, I guess. Yes, yeah. But then I also had my sisters who were not into rock at all. And they were into R&B, reggae, like dance hall, all of the other stuff. So it was like a really weird contrast of, of different influences. So for example, I can sing all of the dancehall hits from 1990s. <laughs> I don't know why. I, I don't own any of their records, but I know it because of my wow. sisters were huge, huge fans of that. And then I know all of Jethro Tull, um, anything that they've ever put out. My dad loved it. So my dad, I think, was the rocker first. So, oh, or not first. Sick. Oh my gosh. So it runs in your family, literally. I th- yeah, sir, I think so. Um, started with oh. grandpa. Papa, Papa knew, Papa knew. <laughs> wow. And you just found that out recently? Really? Recently, like within oh. the last like three or four years. Yeah. Yeah, I know. No one, see, okay, this is the thing with the South African people. We're just like, sometimes we don't really talk a lot about things. And then you, all of a sudden you find out a bunch of things about the family all at the same time. I'm like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> what is going on? <laughs> Uh, I can see Fallon. That is so yeah. empowering. That's beautiful. Yeah, it's great. It's so cool. So yeah, rewinding it back, what was it like the early '90s, the the 2000s, as a rocker, as a black rocker at that time? It's funny because I have only really been asked that question in retrospect. Because at the time, no one ever asked me what's it like being a woman of color in that in that space. Because the woman part kind of took over. Okay. And I was never, ever asked, which I think is interesting. And I don't really know. And maybe it was because I was like the token brown girl in the group. Okay, fine, whatever. But like no one ever said a- a- anything to me. Like they never, I also had some interesting realizations too. Like, and it didn't bother me at the time because I was so, also a child. I was very, very yeah. young. So I'll tell you one time. Somebody had said at a show in Tallahassee, they're like, oh, the skinheads are here. And I'm like, what? 
what the fuck are you talking about? And apparently, they were big fans of Kitty. And I'm like, wow. Walt, how does that work? And it was the first time I'd ever been like, I feel unsafe in this area, in this space. Mm -hmm. Because I never, up until that point, had never really been like, I, I don't feel comfortable or like I feel like I'm in danger right yeah, yeah never before then it was never uh, yeah. a thing and I, I I've only ever been asked that like to, to look back on it because at the time I didn't really even think about it of course. um also because I never really because I'm African first like I'm always I'm just I'm like I'm South African right yeah. it's in and of itself I think is different than identifying as black like being a like African-American I'm not I'm not that I'm, I'm African, <laughs> I'm African. So I always say like, it's unfortunate. I think I didn't realize it at the time, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I get that. How, how much of an impact it would have had for people to see, like, for example, me seeing somebody like uh, Rachel True. Oh, Rachel from the craft. Oh my God. Right? Seeing her, I was like, wait a second. I look like her. You know what I mean? Like we're, we're both the same skin tone. Like she's in like kind of a witchy movie and whatever like what that kind of representation does for us yeah as people of color like seeing that and being like oh wow like i i have a i have a place and whatever but i didn't oh. for some reason i didn't really realize that as much at the time the impact i might have been having yeah and i kind of i do regret that i really do I regret not speaking up and saying anything and being like hey by the way Fuck the fact that I'm young and fuck the fact that I'm a woman. I'm also a woman of color in this space, which is unfortunately yeah. um, inhabited by people like that came to that show. Yeah, yeah, like them, yeah. And oh, people, yeah. you know what I mean? Like that's an added. That's an entire know, facet like, that I did not consider, but that's also maybe why you didn't feel comfortable speaking up because now you know that they're there. Now true. they're in the room with you. Yeah, and true. What would that I, I feel, your response, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, that changes everything. Yeah, like I feel guilty not saying anything at the time, being like, "Hey, like this is that's not okay. They should not be available. Like, it should not." And I was like, "Okay, well, I'm kind of outnumbered here because no, yeah, absolutely think about the ratio there was just uh, like, you know, overwhelmingly white people than me. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like, like, exactly. Like, where is the time and the place? like back in that era to really say that thing and feel safe, like you're saying. Like, I think that's a really good point too. Now we feel comfortable because we know people will have our back and we won't be cast out. But maybe in those days it would have felt like, I don't know if I should say Why do you have to make it about right? Yeah. It's like, okay, well, you know, if I'm not feeling comfortable, like, is that not enough for you? But okay. Exactly, <laughs> like, yeah, because like on our end, I don't think they understand like race is the reason that we are uncomfortable. And that's Thank the reason you. that they're there too, right? Like the yeah. space specifically come for that reason. So exactly, and the, I'm about like, what, it isn't there. Mm -hmm. Why else would anybody like that show up at the show, right? In full regalia, you know what I mean? Like they're they want to be known as those people at that show. Like that, there's whatever. No, that's it's, real. That's I, real. I have a lot. I feel some kind of way about it in retrospect because I didn't make enough of, of, of a stand or enough of a like look at the fact that I'm existing in this space as well. So yeah, I can talk about it now, no, <laughs> but that's absolutely. not the way that it was then, right? It was like, yeah. you know. The culture itself, the climate is why you were reluctant. True. And true, 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 true. Yeah, I don't want you to feel bad because it was so much, there's so much animosity that I think was thrown at you and at Kitty all at once to have you deal with the racial component would have been a lot, you know? For sure, for sure. But I will say too, now that I look back on it, um, say when Max Cavalera left Sepultura mm -hmm. and Derek Green joined, I think that was also when I was like, oh wait, maybe as black as black people and as people of color in this space, we're not necessarily as welcome as we thought because there was a lot of backlash when he there joined. Was. There was. They're like, oh, well. Like, no, that doesn't work. Ugh. And then I'm like, wait, what is this because you don't like him as the singer? Or is it because he's a black man singing for that? That that's that that's like a whole conversation that we should be having. Yeah, no, that's especially fact. in metal. That's fact, especially and, in metal, yeah. And it was like, okay, maybe I'm not as welcome as I thought it was. Or maybe we just people didn't say anything. I don't know. I don't know. It's uh what I'm trying to say is that at the time I didn't really have the capacity to understand exactly 
what was happening and I didn't have the, the words to verbalize what I wanted to possibly say to people if they, you know, if they even noticed. I respect that a lot, Alan. Thank you. You know, because it's like drawing a line from that specific timeline to here. That is why Black Rockers United is a thing. You know, it's because Nate had a similar experience. Actually worse, someone called him the N-word at a show. And a scene that like our people created, right? That we used to feel comfortable in. Now we realize we're the outliers because people don't expect us to be there, right? But now we feel very empowered and proud of who we are. And it's taken about 20 years from the point that you had that experience to get to that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not to say that when I was growing up, I, I mean, I grew up in an all white neighborhood. Like I grew up surrounded always, almost always being the other person. Like I went to a school that was absolutely like 99% white people. And there was just me. Like I, I was, it, that's always been my experience. And so I just kind of got used to being the other and I'm like, am I ever, did I ever feel empowered to say anything and be like, this is kind of weird. Um, you know, so that's, so that's not to say that I was never, it, it was never apparent to me at the time, but obviously I was like, oh, oh, well, here I am being the only one again. Great. Yeah. You're so <laughs> used to being like the, the oddball because that's the way that things were set up. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then it's like being the oddball oddball. I was not only <laughs> yeah, I was like the goth brown girl. It's like they didn't even know what to do with that. They're like, Jesus, you're like so weird. But anyway. 20 years later, I think we love the the alt black scene so much that we still don't know what to do with it, but it's on the opposite end. Like we're just so soaked about it. As opposed to like before, it was just like this the sense of fear, I think, of just like here's black people in the same scene as me. They're goth. They're cooler than me. <laughs> <laughs> what do we do? What do we do? This is when you actually have to try harder to do what you're doing. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, I don't know one person that I know. Yeah. When I was growing up at all that none, I was the only one. <laughs> and so then when I see another one, I'm like, oh my God, what is this? It's, oh. it's so weird. Oh my God, it's so weird. How does it feel to be like alternative on several levels, right? Like you're an alternative musician, you game as well, you produce, you sing. How does it feel to like kind of combine all these interests into like one alternative thing? I think it has also, as I said, it's always kind of been part of my story being kind of the other of all the time. And I've just gotten very used to and very comfortable occupying that space. So, and it's also very empowering in the sense that I can just do whatever the fuck I want. I'm like, if I want to create a big band album, then I will do it because that's the alternative to what people in this, my space would do. So it's like, what is the most antithetical thing that I could have done after leaving Kitty? is having an electronic project. So, ha, yes, I'm going to do that. And it is the most big fuck you to the the really purest metal heads who just refuse to listen to anything else, which I've made no bones about saying that I don't understand that. I have varied influences um, and I've talked about, I remember I got shipped back in the day when I said that I listened to Mariah Carey and Whitney Houston. I was like, I'm sorry, what? I wow. said it in some magazine, some inter some somebody was like asking me, like, what's your guilty pleasure or whatever? And I'm like, not really a guilty pleasure. I'll say it. I listen to Mariah Carey. I listen to fucking Whitney Houston. I listen to these people. I love them. Their voices are amazing. Wonderful. Like, how can you not uh respect what they're doing? Right. And yes. people are like, it's not very metal of you. It's like Guys, seriously, really? come on. It, it's almost like a, a kind to be a contrarian, right? <laughs> it's like, I really want to do this electronic project. You think I'm going to do a metal project, but I'm not going to because I know you want me to. So I'm not going to. You know what I mean? I yes. So. Fuck you to the purest. <laughs> We're doing what we want to do. And I just would like to say thank you for standing up for Black women vocalists because they've had a huge impact on rock and metal. That's just, yeah. me. you know what I mean? Like the way that they sing, the the artists that they've collaborated with, I think it would be kind of ridiculous to disregard their influence yeah. in music as a whole because they've done so much, you know? It's just like, why wouldn't you listen to them? Yeah, the only other 
woman that I saw doing kind of similar at the time was Skin from Skunk and Nancy. Uh -huh, and I was like, oh my God, I love her. She's just so powerful, beautiful. It mm -hmm. was like, it was just like kind of the same as Grace Jones, but like just this different, just mm -hmm. harder vibe and whatever. I mm -hmm. fucking love her. She's yeah. amazing. Love her. If you threw Grace Jones into a mosh pit, you would get Skin and Nancy. That's Skin, yeah, <laughs> right? Yeah. And so that was really the only other woman that kind of looked like me that was in that space. And that's, cool. I, I have to give her credit for fronting this, this amazing band and being such a great presence and, and just being a sex goddess. Love her. She's amazing. 100%. Is she like a major influence for you? If you had to like choose, I guess, like three as someone coming up as a woman of color and rock. Is Skin and Nancy one of the people that you're like, that is it. That's what I want to do. This is what. No, I didn't realize that she existed until much later, unfortunately. Oh. Uh, <laughs> my influences were very much influenced by the people that I was around at the time. So I was listening to a lot of Hole. So unfortunately, Courtney Love was like a big thing because it was like a woman doing it. She didn't look anything like me whatsoever, but loved Hole a lot. And also Nirvana was like, massively influential on me and then like all the guys that I was hanging around with are all fucking skater dudes from the 90s what did they listen to they listened to no effects they listened to descendants they listened to all these like punk bands and that's kind of what I by osmosis um was like oh yeah this is great I love this because up until that point I wasn't listening to rock I was listening to whatever my sisters were listening to because I didn't own any albums you know they would listen to god I could name 90s girl groups coming out of the wazoo that were really popular at that time and i can sing all of their fucking songs but never owned one of their albums mm -hmm. ever <laughs> and i think that has a lot to do with my sister's influence but then i started being introduced to green day's dookie when it came out and i'm like oh this is fun i like this very cool and yeah so that's that's when thing that's when i joined the dark side if you want to say that, I mean, fuck. I from there on, I was just like sold. Like, give it in, get in right in my veins. Let's do it. Let's give me the rocks. So it was like a lot of the the skating culture and punk yeah. culture that brought you into that. That's what I thought. It is yeah. so captivating. It really is. It really is. Like a lot. Of, that's pretty much all we did, right? Like, we're. I mean, I came from a smaller city, whatever. And what would we do? We would hang out at the, the mini mart or whatever and try and get people to buy us cigarettes or something like that. Like that was kind of our life. And we guys would sit there and they would do ollies on the, on the pavement and we would just pavement. sit around and loiter. It was yeah. like, that was, yeah, and listen yeah. to the descendants. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Jay and Silent yeah. Bob with skateboards. For yes, real. <laughs> exactly, exactly like that. I, I can so... It, it even like dazed and confused to some degree. Even a little bit, yeah, a little era, bit. But like, <laughs> kind of like that. We were just loitering fucking kids. I have so much nostalgia from, from that time, from just sitting there being like, oh my God, what a time. Sounds so fun. Yeah. Yes. This is how Fallon became a rocker and I love it. This is such a yeah. cool origin story. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> no, thank you. Yeah, so on that note, I wanted to ask you, what setup or like what kind of environment helps you most for creating music? Um... I have a thing that I also, I can't write music during the day. So stupid. But if I can make it so that it looks like a dark cave during the day, then I'm able to do it. I write some of my best stuff when it's at night uh, and late at night usually. So I, I rarely ever use the overhead lights. They're always going to be like mood light. It has to be moody in here to I set that. Back. See, I've been trying to turn my <clears throat> apartment into a spaceship for a while. So it's all like mood lighting with like this LED, like whatever. I'm trying to do that. It's a very small space, so it's easy to do. That really inspires me too. Um, so it needs to be like chill, comfortable. And then sometimes it just comes out of nowhere too. A patron of mine, bless his, bless his heart, he bought me or gifted me rather a pedal, a fuzz pedal. So I was trying it out and I'm like, oh, this is great. And then I just started singing something to it. And I'm like, oh, this is good. This is good. This is great. All right. Turn on the voice memos or whatever on my iPhone. And it's got this like kind of 90s fuzzy, like great because it's a fuzz pedal. 
And I'm like, I don't know if this is amphibious and salty, but it's gotta be something, it's great. Uh, so it can be just something like that. It's getting a new piece of equipment that can spark an idea. So yeah, that's it. <laughs> so cool. It's a mixture of what you have access to and then the space itself, right? Yes. Absolutely, yep. Yep, yep, 100%. And you're definitely a nighttime person, so you have to feel the sense, the ambience of night, right, in order to create. What's yeah. funny is that I'm not. I'm actually a morning <laughs> person. <laughs> so I'm a morning person, but I also can't write until it's at night. So I I prefer to get up early if I can. I'm not like a like five o'clock in the morning type person, but like, you know, early for a musician. So eight o'clock, whatever, get up. I don't drink coffee, so I just get up, drink some water, skull some, you know, whatever. And I can't write during the day. I just can't do it. Well, it's not to say that I can't do it as I, I usually won't do it. I'll wait until much, much later in the day uh, or later in the evening to do it. I don't know. It's a weird quirk I have. I'm not sure. Actually pretty similar. Um, and it's not yeah. it's like, there's just a certain energy, the certain like yes. genesis that comes from night. Yes. Like, come during yeah. the day, Fallon. I just understand. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Love that. That's 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 it. It's totally it. It has a, you know, and but then also space. Going to a space really inspires me too. So, for example, for Simulacrama, I spent a bit of time in Chinatown, Chinatown here in Toronto. Lots of lights, lots of like what you would assume would be in a cyberpunk world, right? A lot of what's like the tropes that are associated with cyberpunk as a genre. You have the like, you know, signs that are in either kanji or something else. It just had that vibe to it. I'm like, oh my God, oh, I can yeah. hear it. I can hear these like really driving synths and whatever. It was very, very inspiring. And I still go there sometimes to, to feel that because I, I feel like now cyberpunk has become like such a part of my identity. <laughs> it's like, uh, so the new album, I think, will have elements of that, but it will be like a one step even further and i'm so excited because this is the time that i'm going to play with costumes and like marry my love of cosplay and like all that nerdy shit gotta marry the two there and i started sewing yeah. and it's it's one of those one of those the hobbies that i haven't dropped yet sewing making a shirt very happy about it yeah so i'm gonna marry some of that costumes it's gonna be great love it Lit. you have a new album coming out is it coming out this year or are you still in the works still in the works i did have one song that i recorded in december but then i hated the i hated the vocals that i came up with it so i'm going to rewrite the vocals a little bit That's and also with my patreon too i come i write songs specifically for my patrons and it just exists within the patreon world which is kind of like a precursor to what's coming with the album I mean, it's it's probably not going to be too too different from what was on Simulacrum, but it will be yeah, kind of kind of similar. I don't know. I'm working on it. It's coming. Maybe oh. I was hoping to have it out like this month, but it's not going to happen because I'm still waiting for grants and because I yeah I need other funding to make it happen. Um, exactly. It's it's going to take some time for you to do this process yeah. the way that you want, but you know and we're just waiting. Put out an album. <laughs> I just put out one last year, so exactly. it's like. I need give it some time to yes, to no. realize the scope that I would like it to be. Beautiful, beautiful. How does it feel a year after Simula Crema looking back on this gorgeous album? Are you proud? Are you excited? Are you ready for more? Ooh, very, very excited. I'm proud of that work because it was I started it in May of 2020 and finished it in October, which is like super, super quick turnaround for me. Yeah. I was like, oh my God. But Remember also that some of the songs I had already started writing in 2014. So I had some stuff. It was just a matter of like refining it and turning it into the, what I had envisioned for the album at that time. Yes. So I was super, super excited to get that done in such a short time. And then I also got a grant in order for me to actually just go into the studio and do it, which I was one of the few people that actually recorded an entire full length album on that grant, which is awesome. And yeah, that. I'm immensely proud of it. And of course, when I listen to it now, I'm like, oh, I could have done so much better with this and change this and whatever. Yeah. It's a curse of being a perfectionist. I'm sure you understand, or maybe you know, you know what that's like, where you're just like, I could have done something. That's better. Like every time. <laughs> yeah. 
but that was exactly what it needed to be at the time. And that's what I kept reminding myself. It's perfect for what it was at the time. And it, it will exist in that space. And maybe I can like remaster, remix things, whatever in a, at a later time, but now that's what it is. And now we just move on. <laughs> so <laughs> wise words from Fallon. It kicks so much ass to see you like embrace alternative after all this time. It's grown, it's evolution. It's beautiful. And I am inspired yeah. by you, my friend. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. That I'm always like, so why would anybody want to look at me as somebody that they want to emulate? I don't know. But I also will give myself credit where credit is due. I am a very ambitious person. So if I set my mind to something, I will fucking pursue it until I get it. And that's probably one of the like traits that a lot of people, like friends of mine, they'll say like, oh yeah, that's you hundred percent. You, <laughs> you don't sit around and do nothing. That's, you were always like, like this. Yeah, that's true. Isn't it? Oh God. It's my Capricorn rising. <laughs> driven, yes, exactly. Driven yeah. and and focused on the goal. They know what they want and you got to yeah. go for it. You know? Yeah, yeah. All business. So that's how I do. <laughs> where does the future of rock go? Where are you going from here, Fallon? Ooh, I have flirted with the idea of doing a hardcore project. I'm a huge hardcore fan, like massive hardcore fan. And I'm talking like, either New York or like California, either or. Uh, so for example, like Strife is one of my favorite bands of all time. They're, they're fucking incredible. Like so fucking good. And I nearly, piece of me, died when Chad, their bass player, he uh, reached out to me like a while ago when I, when I was in Katie Still and he's like, hey, I just wanted to say your band is really awesome. I'm like, um, sorry, no, my band sucks. In comparison to yours, just fucking say it, okay? <laughs> you guys are amazing. And uh, uh, like just su such huge, huge fan and like huge fan of Earth Crisis too. They're like huge. Anyway, so I, I have grandiose ideas of making that into a project that I, you know, just get like other people to play on. And then we obviously I'm not going to do screaming because I don't do screaming anymore. So we would probably get somebody to do the screaming parts. Yeah. But I've been flirting with that idea for a while and like teasing it on my discord. I'm like, maybe I should do that. Should I do that? And people are like, yes. <laughs> But it doesn't, it's not going to be new metal. It's not going to be like any other kind of metal. It's going to be straight up hardcore. Like that's, you know, so that people can do, have a circle pit and have fun too. So I don't know if that's going to ever become a thing, but it's, it's a thing in my head. And yeah, and just Amphibious Assault's fourth album. That's, that's it. That's all. And then I'm also acting too. I don't know if you know that, but I act as well. Yes. Let's hear about your acting like career. Like, what are you excited about too. being in? <laughs> Uh, I started actually after I left Kitty, I didn't really have a tribe anymore. Like I didn't have anybody to like hang out with. And the first people to really like take me in, uh, this loss of the lamb that, you know, going back to school, I went back to high school. So I was like, Oh, I don't know anybody in the, the theater kids. Like, we're just like, join us, join us. So I'm like, okay. And my father is an actor. So, uh, he acted professionally up until like the early nineties. So I have it in my blood too. Performance, right. just performance in general mm. and got the acting bug. Like you wouldn't believe. Uh, then I had applied actually to go to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts in New York and then promptly chickened out. It's like, I can't do it. Can't do it. Can't go. It's, it's too, too much pressure. So I didn't end up going. And that was in, what is that? 2003 ish. And I only really got back on the stage, as, you, as it were, when I was living in Denmark in 2015. Snap! So, and it was for English-speaking theater, and it was the first time I'd ever, like, it was insane. Like, that was the first time I'd been on a stage, acting stage, in a while. And so I love theater. Theater is, like, like my life. And then I switched to film and television in 2019. So I did a ton of commercials. National, U.S. national commercials, Canadian commercials. And then I had my network debut on Good Sam with Sophia Bush, which came out uh, just uh, January 22nd, I think. She wasn't in the scene with me, but she's lovely. Love her. Love her. She's a very lovely person. Um, Omar Muscati was my par scene partner. He was great. Great. Love him. So... Going down that track, yes. I'm, I'm going to be in Mass Effect one day, 
I'm, I'm not for real, but one day I'm going to be in a movie remake of a game. It's going to happen. Fingers crossed. Cross all fingers, please. Thank you. <laughs> put her in Mass Effect when you make the movie. Okay? Please put me in Mass Effect. That will be the best Liara ever. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, in Bioshock, whenever they make In Bioshock. Oh. Whenever they make that. Girl, yes. Yes. Okay. Bioshock would be great. Although I'm not picky. Okay. Like whatever you want. <laughs> You're like, I'll take what I get. Um, <laughs> Bioshock. Uh, Mass Effect would be great too. Hey, I know Halo is a thing. Uh, I don't know if it's a movie or if it's a series, but uh, hire me for that too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So rad. I want to see where your incredible journey takes you, Fallon. Keep us posted. Thanks. Don't give up because <laughs> we need you out there, right? We need rockers killing it out here. Just like you. Never. I will never give up. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah. For caring. I very much appreciate it. Thanks for joining us because truly this has made my night and everyone at Brew is going to be so thrilled that they got to see Fallon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, tell them I say hello to all and uh, yeah. yeah. Thanks. I'll keep you posted on how things are progressing. <laughs> <laughs> you. Don't be a stranger, Fallon. And Certainly not. We are signing out, which much love to you and uh, telling you to rock on and stay safe. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.